this time. We worship you and we praise you. We lift you up in this place, Lord God, and we ask you, Heavenly Father, to come in this place once again. We ask you, Lord God, to let there be clarity and let there be understanding, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And so for tonight, what I wanted to do is just do a little bit of the back to the future because I don't want to belabor the time. And so um, normally we would have um, some other preliminaries, but I wanted to get into it. And so just to bring everybody up to speed, what was spoken about last week. Last week we were talking about faith that makes sense. And so one of the things I want to do in review is to talk about, number one, how does logic or reason relate to true belief? And this is just a review, so you have to get in where you fit in. Number one, is belief just a matter of thinking logically or examining the evidence or recognizing reality and the truth or the answer is unfortunately not. Next up, so the question also is, well, how does logic or reason relate to true belief or really believing in the things of God? Well, real belief involves more than just information transfer and external recognition of a truth. It's more than you just saying, I believe God, and then that's it. People act contrary to evidence all the time. So just saying that you know what truth is and things like that, or I know that the truth is that I should love one another, we know that, and we have the evidence of that, but how many of you know that you, just because you know that, that does not mean that you do it? So people act in contrary to the evidence all the time. So likewise, when, if I'm an atheist, I have to purposely repress the truth within myself. And even though the, the heavens declare the glory of God, I can act contrary to even to what I see in the atmosphere and attribute it to something else. Or that the universe came up together with one big giant bang and then boom, then all of a sudden you have earth, you have animals, you have all these different types of species that do not have a common ancestor. They have a common creator, but they do not have a common ancestor. Remember. God creates things like an orchard. In other words, everything is after its own kind, the bird kind, the dog kind, the cat kind. Everything is after its kind, but you're not going to have a human, cat, dog, bird kind. And then it splits up into everything else. God created everything individually on its own. Now, next up, for if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, and that comes out of Hebrews chapter 20. Six, chapter 10, verse 26, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 basically says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together so that you could edify each other. And the way that you edify each other is that you speak on things in regards to knowledge. Last couple of slides in the review from last week. So to conclude, how does logic or reason relate to true belief? Number one, real belief belongs or it involves a will, W-I-L-L. Let's look at these two common type of um, uh, thought processes. Also, as a side note, a sidebar, if you have ever heard someone say that um, um, religion or belief in God is an opiate for the masses, if you ever heard that buzz term, that buzz term actually comes from Karl Marx, which was a known Marxist. Socialism. Prominent mindset that was over in old Soviet Union and actually many people today, even in the United States. So anytime you hear that, please understand that he was firmly against the church because his thought process or the way that he did things, we understand that in, in Christ there is liberty, there is freedom. But when it comes to that particular Marxism, there is no freedom in that. So that's why they're diametrically opposed to each other. All right. And also opiate also induces that there's some type of drug to, to, to sedate you from the realities of life. No, if anything, it helps you deal with the realities of life. So here's some two quotes. Nietzsche says, if one were to prove this God of the Christians to us, we should even, we should be even less able to believe in him. <laughs> Number two, it is our preference that rules against Christianity, not argument. So it's not about what evidence, it's all about preference. I would prefer not to listen to people who believe in God. Next up, real belief, once again, involves will. So let's look at Mark chapter 2, verse 8. Mark chapter 2, verse 8, paraphrase it here. Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? 
That's what they do. You have to come up to a conclusion to say that their God does not exist. Number two, Luke 24, verses 25 says, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. So notice how it says in the first one, belief comes from the heart. Second one, people are slow to believe in the heart. The third one, Romans 10.10 10 says, for with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And you understand also that when it comes to believing in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, you have to believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. So it starts with the heart. But God does not want you to be devoid of understanding things of the mind. He said, love you. Uh, God wants you to love you with all of his, all of your heart, all of your soul. That's your mind. That's synonymous with mind and all of your strength. That's your body. So he doesn't, he never said, love me with all of your spirit and your body only. And just be ignorant Christians and not even knowing how to defend the faith. Not even getting into the point to where, you know, you're doing all this religious stuff and all of but you don't even know what you believe or why you believe what you believe. It's just because you grew up in grandmama's and daddy's house. You got the big Bible on the on the on the on the on the, on the, on the coffee table, and it's there. And you, boom, you just happen to be a, a grandfathered into the Christian religion. Amen. And you usually end up being very religious because you have not been born again. You have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Next up, Irving Kristall, a professor of social thought, says. When we lack the will to see things as they really are, there is nothing so mysterious as the obvious. Oh, my goodness. And then finally, the end result of agreeing that a logical reason and faith actually do go together is this. Number one, a true philosophical foundation is best for believing something. The Bible is not just a philosophy, okay? It is a way of life. It is true. Number two, adherence to the first principle is mandatory in life and in faith. Also, logical fallacies. Remember, the word fallacy means weak argument. Logical weak arguments must be recognized and overcome. Well, who created God? Or um, other different types of weird logical fallacies, and there's a couple of them that are out there. I'll give you a couple of examples because some of y'all are looking at me like, what do you mean? But here's some logical fallacies, significance, or in other words, you'll see somebody say, well, Jesus is the son of God. That's what the Christians believe, but Jehovah Witnesses believe that too. But if you go a little bit deeper when you, they open up the door and y'all begin to conversate, you'll say, well, I believe that Jesus is God, don't you? Then you take that thing begins to divide. But if you don't know that, you'll say that, well, we believe in the same thing. It's all relative. Next up, faulty dilemma. Are you a person of science or facts or a person of faith? Remember, you don't have to be either or. You can be, as in the Eastern terminology, both and. You can be a person of faith and you can also be an intellectual or a person that understands what you believe and why. Next up, Here's a category mistake. Once again, here's a logical fallacy. Who made God? Because that's what their whole idea is. Well, who made God? If God made us, then who made God? But we have to remember that God is the uncaused one. If he always was and always is and always will be, then he never had a beginning. He always was there. But in our human minds, our beginning is conception and our ending is death. But we have to understand that we all came from somewhere and that we're in different categories. It's really good. It's really hard to understand that. Another one, faulty analogy. Believing in God is like believing in Santa Claus. Both of them don't exist. Well, better yet, both of them have um, uh, uh, commercialized, and both of them, you see them all over the place. Right, right. But that's a faulty analogy because Santa Claus really was based after the real thing. St. Nicholas, he actually was a saint. And he, well. <sighs> and then the other one that sometimes um, people of, of non-belief say, or consensus gentium, or majority opinion. Well, you know, here's how many of y'all have heard this. The vast majority of scientists believe in evolution. How many times have you all seen it in CNN or MSNBC or Fox News or whatever type of our, our, our different types of um, 
news articles out there and you see something about science, the Hubble telescope, whatever it is, and or, or the God particle, and then they say something like, the vast majority of scientists believe, or scientists believe that we may actually have derived ourselves from some primordial soup. But if you look at all of those articles, they always say believe. Scientists believe. Very rarely do they say scientists know. So why do they say believe so much? And then the atheist or the agnostic says, well, look at all the evidence that the scientists have come up with. Scientists believe this. Look, the majority of them agree. But majority does not mean right. A majority of people believe in slavery, but that doesn't mean it's right. So majority in numbers don't necessarily mean that it's correct. So that was the end of that. Pluralism also is a belief system should be ruled out. I was in a debate with um, a small little debate or educational session with a young man that was on Facebook. He reminded me of some of the other individuals that I used to debate with back in college many years ago. And he, the, the, the individual put on his wall, I call, and I won't even say what the word is, but he basically was questioning it in an article that one of his friends sent him about um, a Bible that was found in the year 1500 that was old and tattered, and it basically had an inscription in there that, that stated that um, Jesus Christ never was crucified. Okay. And so he said, I don't believe that. And so then there was a long conversation, and one of the things that was written was this one particular individual that said, well, it's very dangerous for you to be so closed-minded, young man, or I'll just call him um, um, Brother SR, or SD, Brother SD. It's, 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 it's uh, 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 brother, brother SD, it, it, it's too closed-minded for you to be able to assert something like that. We should always be open-minded, and we should never, ever tell people what to believe or what not to believe. And then what I said was, well, the reason why and then I wrote down, I was like, well, this is actually an affront to the Christian faith because if, we, if he is not risen, then we are, our belief is in vain. Our preaching is in vain. And one of the other people were saying, well, you know, um, you should always consider information, especially if it totally turns upside down an entire religious system. Because if Jesus Christ didn't die on the cross, then all of our sins still count against us. That's what the Bible says. And so we are hopelessly dying in our sins if Jesus did not rise again. All of your sins count against you, and when God judges, everybody will be guilty, and no one's going to heaven. <laughs> and so I had to put a response that was like a, almost like a several paragraphs long against that, and I basically said, young man, you're asserting a pluralistic or a relativistic type of worldview. You are putting forth agnosticism, and also you're uh, basically saying that, th that the Christian faith or uh, my belief is unfounded based on the article. Now, here's the thing. I, he said, well, you know, who's to say? And I was like, well, first of all, let's look at the author of the article. It was from a website that was called, uh, <laughs> uh, what was it? Uh, Mor Hashem or Mor Harem or Mor Hashem. That's what the name of the website was from. And so when I went to the website, I broke down the words. I said, more, okay, those are Muslim type people. And then uh, I looked at Hashem, and that's a derivative of the word harem. So I basically said, you basically got this information from a, a, a website that has, that is basically like world star hip hop, number one. Number two, Moors, a lot of black folks like to think that they're Moors, but no, there's, 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 there's black people who were Moors back in the day, but as of today, that's not the case anymore unless you're in Africa or the Sudan. So that's number two. Number three, did you look at the word harem? Harem actually means a group of women together and, and you're condoning polygamy. But you want to call this true and for want me to consider this without any other additional evidence. It's an opinion piece. And so he got kind of mad with me. And then I basically stated to him, well, you need to understand that. And then here's the thing that really got me. And we could go ahead and go on the next slide. The thing that really got me is, is that he said, well, 
Um, I believe that, I'm not going to say what people don't believe, because I believe whatever you pray to, quote unquote, whatever you pray to, you should always do things in pay, prayer and in faith. But, you know, sometimes faith is really wishful thinking. And that was those buzzwords. And he also said, to each is their own. Remember, I talked all about each is their own. To each is their own. And you also need to be open-minded. So this young man was a pluralist. He wasn't going to say any truth. He wasn't going to affirm any truth. And I said, agnosticism, by its very nature, is contradictory. Because if you affirm that there is no truth, then you're also saying what you are saying is, is not the truth. And I could view what your statements are as contradictory. I didn't go, now here's what I did. I didn't go after the, the evidence or the facts. I went after the world view. That's what I attacked was the world view. And then I said, if you want me to be open-minded, I can't be open-minded. I, I could be, I, put it this way. The buzzword open-minded to you is I should consider what you're saying is truth versus what I believe what open-minded is, is me hearing you out and listening. Open-minded means maybe I should question what I believe. No, open-minded, as I understand it, is I need to understand what you're saying, and I need to be polite, and I need to hear you out, and then tell you that you're wrong. Okay? All right. So rejecting pluralism does not mean that various religions are wholly false, because there's some truths. And that's where legends come from. Do you understand that legends are basically um, things that, like the legend of the unicorn, there is a such thing as a unicorn. It's an animal that happens to have one horn sticking out of the head. So if you see a bull and it has one horn on one side and no horn on the other side, which is pretty common, then that is what you call a unicorn. So there is some truth, but it's not the my little pony, my little pony. It's not the my little pony unicorn with a whole bunch of rainbows coming out the rear end. No, nothing like that. <laughs> so real belief, as we conclude with our review, still involves more than understanding of a logical position. A.W. Tozier, which I'm starting to really get into his writings now, he's a contemporary, if you will, of uh, C.S. Lewis said this. He said, so skilled is error at imitating truth that the two are constantly being mistaken for each other. It takes a sharp eye these days to know which brother is Cain and which is Abel. fan him down like that. I was like, preach, sir. I know you're dead, but you're preaching to me anyway. Amen. So I just wanted to let you know that. I felt the Holy Spirit with that. So you do have to understand that people can't tell the difference between the two. So now we segue into God in 30 seconds. Y'all be like, Pastor Mark, what are you talking about? Well, how am I going to view this? So let's look at the, the initial statement of this. Why do we have something rather than nothing at all. And so here's the premise. The premise or the underlying question to, to understand it, not understanding God in 30 seconds, the reason why I said God in 30 seconds is I can pose to you an argument that God exists in 30 seconds. That's the underlying, that's the underlying part. Now many of all many of you know, but every now and then some of you really may not really know because you were grandfathered in to the faith. But Here's the statement. Why do we have something rather than nothing at all? And this was Martin Heidegger, the fundamental question of metaphysics. In other words, that statement all comes back to, does God exist? So entertain me for a moment, if you will, because, you know, why would we ask a question if we're in a temple or a, a, a structure that's full of disciples? Well, like I said, not everybody really believes in all of this stuff. So number one. Here's four theoretical answers. Number one, reality is an illusion. Now, this is the answer. Hold on for a second, because somebody might have got lost right there. These are answers to why do we have something rather than nothing at all. So here's some answers to that statement, okay? So you, everybody follow me? So the answer, number one, is reality is an illusion. I had, was in a conversation with a, a young man a couple of months ago, and he said, um, well, don't you know that we're in the matrix? And see, I, I have one of those minds that kind of entertains stuff like that. It's like me and Lady Martin, we, we went to go see Matrix like way back in the day when we were first dating, and she fell asleep on the movie, and I just kept watching it. So I was like, okay. <laughs> I see our conversations. <laughs> 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 
So she wasn't interested in that. So reality is an illusion, is it? Well, what is an illusion? Illusion is something that acts as if it really is there, but it's not really there. In other words, we're in an, a, an ongoing dream state. Yeah. So that's answer number one. Now answer number two, reality is or was self-created. In other words, reality created itself, and God didn't have anything to do with it. Number three, reality is self-existent or eternal. And then number four, reality was created by something that is self-existent. Amen. So either it's an illusion or reality created itself and it wasn't God, or reality is self-existent, it always was there without any creator, or reality was created by something that is self-existent, which is God himself. So here's a simple proof for God. I just want you to think about this for a minute. What we're feeding into over the next several weeks, and we're gonna shift into the, to the Jesus and, and things like that later, but I have to get your worldview right where it needs to be. So number one, here's the simple proof that God exists. Number one, something exists. Number two, nothing cannot cause something. Number three, therefore a necessary and eternal being exists. Amen. Something exists. And I think about this often and I, and I begin to glorify God even more because I'm like, man, when, when, when you appreciate how the gospel, the, how the Bible says that, that, that David said, we're fearfully and wonderfully made, that you have eyes, you can move. I, even when I walk, I just start being in amazement at how God created all of this stuff. How you look at a little ant and how the ant is different from a love bug that's all flattered up against the front of my car today. And uh, uh, how that's different from a love bug and how a dog is different from a cat and how my eye can focus. We have these DSLR cameras for movies, but my eye does it naturally. We were born with a vision that was in high definition, out of the box. But we have two eyes, one nose and one mouth, whereas a spider has like eight or nine eyes. Or a fly has several several eyes on its head, so that's the reason why you can't smash it because it got an eye looking straight at you, but it's faced that way. Self-preservation. But it's also there for food for something else, for a frog that can And everything functions independently of each other. Have you ever seen, a, a, I, I, here's, a, here's a thing that also makes me wonder about this. When I go to Disney World or I go to these theme parks and I see all of these animatronic uh, things that look like humans and they move around and things like that. And I was like, you know what? It really shows the limitations of humans because God has all these living things that does all this stuff in sync like a wonderful orchestra and then when humans try to create a music part, it breaks down and I got to do maintenance over it and over again. Amen. So humans can't create something, wind up and then release it and then it perpetuates and then it grows and it begins to multiply. <coughs> Next up, can the existence of God be argued or proposed in 30 seconds or less? Well, someone start, start the stopwatch. Jamar, go ahead and got the stopwatch. Either that, he's sleeping, one of those two. No, he, I know he's up. So, so let's start the stopwatch so fast. Number one, I exist. That means you exist. That's what you should say yourself. Number two, if I exist, then something must have always existed because something does not come from nothing. Next up. So we have two choices, an impersonal eternality, the universe, or a personal eternality, God. Science has disproven the concept of an eternal universe because the universe had a beginning. It is expanding. It came from a initiate or a, a, an initial point. Even if you say it was the Big Bang, it was still God that slapped his hands together. Amen. Next up, therefore, God exists. That's easy, 30 seconds. Remember, something can't come from nothing. Amen. When I look at all of you all, or when we have a Sunday morning service and things like that, and everybody's talking and conversing and speaking to each other, I'm like, wow, everybody's brain is moving. Nobody has metal parts. I have a metal part in my knee. It's like a little fish hook. But outside of that, that's not the original design. And everybody has their own thought processes, different dreams, different visions, different speaking. People do different things, different talents, all this different stuff. Everybody, even if you're twins, you still have different fingerprints from each other. Unique. You have blood in your body. 
You can have a blood transfusion to another person, and then it replaces and fills itself back up on its own. You have automatic virus detection inside of your body to where when you get sick, then you have white blood cells that attack that particular infection that begins to eat at it and eat at it and eat at it until it's gone. That's why you get tired sometimes because you're fighting off infection. So it is in the natural. It's also the same way in the spirit. And you're like that out of the box. Amen. That's why sometimes it makes God very upset when, pe when you treat yourself any old kind of way. So let's look at it a little bit closer, because I heard the Pastor Martin, I heard him here, I exist. Well, let's look at it deeper. Number one, I exist. You must exist in order to express or express doubt that you exist. You have to be here in order for you to doubt that you're here. Amen. Sometimes I wish I was a millionaire, and I closed my eyes and opened them back up. I was like, is this a dream or not? No, I still <laughs> got to put $59 worth of gas in my car for $10. 10, 10, 10 gallons. The reality is still there. But in order for you to understand that reality, then you know that you have to exist. It's just, it's just, just something simple. So let's look at the next phrase. Next phrase says, denying your existence is a self-defeating statement. Notice what Descartes says. He says, I think, therefore I am. If your loss is going to get better, I promise you. Notice the next statement. Next statement is this. Number two, if I exist, then something must have always existed because something doesn't come from nothing. Look at what Aristotle said. Aristotle said many years ago, he said, nothing is what rocks dream about. No, hold on, hold on. Pause for a second. Nothing is what rocks dream about. A rock is an inanimate dead object. It has molecules in it, truth be told, but a rock doesn't have a dream. I know somebody, a religious person, but say, but the rocks will cry out if they don't praise them. <laughs> it's your religious self. You better cut it out. <laughs> because God can bring something dead to life. I understand that. But nothing is what rocks can dream about. David Hume that's that other individual. If you ever want to hear where somebody always used to bring up evidence, empirical evidence, um, I need proof that God exists, that gentleman right there, David Hume, is the person that came up with that. And that is a, what you would call one of their apostles of their faith or non-faith. So anytime you hear an atheist say, well, I'm looking for empirical evidence that God exists, and that's a straw man argument and all this other different, and that's a fallacy, they studied him. You got that? David Hume. Notice what David Hume says. He said, I never asserted so absurd a proposition as that anything might arise without a cause. Now, this is an atheist saying that <laughs> the laws of physics say that you can't just have something come from nothing. You can't go from life to from nihilism, N-I-H-I-L-I-S-M, nihilism. Nihilism basically says nothing came from nothing. And people have that mindset, so now you have that involved inside of the culture. That's why you can kill people without even batting an eye, because we're animals now. And that's why people love cats, dogs, and all this other stuff like that more than they have people. You make sure your cat gets fed every day. But then when it comes to church, it's like, ah, my back hurt. <clears throat> well, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> so how to think about true nothingness? So, so here, what's the premise for this, Pastor Martin? Well, the premise for this is what do you mean by nothing cannot create something? Well, let's see what really true nothingness is. So let's look at this circle. Inside of the circle, you see a couple of elements. Number one, particles. Matter, energy, space, and motion. Basically everything. Okay. But that's what people say that the universe just came on its own without there being anything there. But you can see that those particular pieces that are there are all invisible, but they're still in existence. How did that get there? How did the ingredients for the cake called life get there if there was not a baker that put it all together? 
Aha! You got something. So let's look at it. This is true nothingness. True nothingness is really you wouldn't have any particles, any protons, neutrons, electrons. You wouldn't have any space, time continuum. You wouldn't have any stars, no galaxy. None of that would be there. No, no, no energy. Because even the scientists said the energy is neither created nor destroyed, but transferred. That's their definition. But I call that the spirit. God's spirit was neither created and it can't be destroyed, but he transfers himself to all of us. That's why he looks at death differently than we do. Amen. I was talking with a young man today, and he said, well, you know, Pastor Martin, um, when is a person really converted into the image and likeness of Christ? And I said, when you die. You mean not before then? Well, you're before, born again before then, but you won't be in your perfected body without worrying, having to worry about sin until you die and go to heaven. Y'all better come to class. You better listen. You better listen. So that means you're never going to be perfect, no matter how long you've been in church. Amen. You'll be fully converted to a true Christian when you die. <laughs> I'm just saying. You'll be totally healed in heaven. Amen. So I was talking to that young man about those specific things, and he asked that particular question. So there has to be a cause. So when you think about nothing, nothing means none of the elements either for the cake. Amen. So let's look at some options, two options. Number one, an eternal universe or an impersonal. When I say impersonal, it's unfeeling, unknowing, does not care. A lot of people have that idea. I know that God exists, but why would he even want to think about a little old us like ants? He's the Bigfoot, we're the ant. Or just like Samuel Jackson said, boot. <laughs> <laughs> meet Ant <laughs> in, 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 that, in that movie it said boot meet Ant here's the boot so some of us had the same idea that where God is so far off he's impersonal he may have created everything but he is like the Greek philosophers think about gods because whenever you look at a lot of the Greek movies um, Percy Jackson uh, Greek mythology um, Zeus basically purposely said I'm not going to intervene within mankind it's against the rules to do that it's against the rules and so they got a little bit of that from God because they are always trying to make God do something. But God is sovereign. You, you, you ever looked at your kid and your kid tried to get you to do something, you just look at him and you keep on doing what you're doing? Well, in the microcosm, God the Father does us the same way when we start throwing temper tantrums. You laying down in the middle of the store. If I pick you up, that means that you won. And you haven't learned anything. But if you keep on screaming, eventually you're going to get up and you're going to come to your senses and you're going to get up and you keep on moving forward. Amen. Because your character has been developed properly. That's why God does not come when you stomp and spit and cry all the time because he's waiting for you to come to your senses and keep on moving. All right, I'm just trying to let you know he's the eternal father. So an eternal universe, impersonal eternality, the cosmos is all there will ever be. In other words, that's his perspective. In other words, you always have the universe. That's all that we're going to have. We got the galaxy. I'm wishing upon the star. I got all that stuff there. It's unfeeling. God does not care about us at all. He's distant. First one, impersonal. Number two, an eternal creator. Personal eternality. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and earth was filled with without form of void, and darkness was a face upon the deep. And then God said, let there be light. And then there was light, and then there was the firmament upon the heavens, and God created man and woman, and the, all of this stuff that's there. That creates a personal aspect to that. Now, many of you have had an encounter with God, whether it's in the dream, or vision, or through his word. The, Bishop Clark said, if you are dreaming about stuff, then you missed what God was saying two times. <laughs> I ain't never forgot that because he speaks to you in his word. That's one of the primary ways that he wants to talk to you. You look at his word. He gets, to the, he gets into your dream if you haven't gotten the, the, the hint yet. You missed it. Amen. It's crazy because, unfortunately, in my own life, I very rarely have dreams. Very rarely have dreams. I can't remember them. I don't know if it's the food. I don't know if it's the, the size of my head. I don't know. I don't know. I don't have dreams very often. I don't remember. I have visions of quite a bit, though. Quite a bit. 
And so when I think about God, I know that he is personal. When you pray, that brings person to person. When you think about Jesus, that's the anthropomistic representation of God or God in the flesh. You can't get to God because that's religion. But God came to you. If God came to you, then there's no reason for religion. But if you try to get to God and you come up with your own style and you try to invent some type of way, then that's why you have 30,000 religions because people want to customize God into their image and likeness versus us conforming to God's image and his likeness. Amen. Science also says this too as well. We're moving pretty good here. Science has also disproven the concept of the eternal universe. The fact is the universe had a beginning. Everything that has a beginning has a cause. The universe had a beginning. Therefore, the universe had a cause. Who did it? Now, what an atheist or somebody who is agnostic or doesn't know God will say, will say something like, well, I know that the universe had a cause, but who caused God? But they're missing the point. If something had a beginning, then something had to create the thing that had the beginning. Or else you just keep on going back and keep on going back. You get what I'm saying? Something eternal had to bring something into existence because if everything had a beginning, then you would just keep on going back infinitely. And you keep on running into eternity. Just think, just think about it. I'm here and if it wasn't for me and Lady Martin, Andre and Jaden would not be here. Andre and Angela Martin are here. If it wasn't for them, I would not be here. Andre and Angela Martin are here, but without Nathan Martin and Odom Martin, they would not, my dad would not be here. So those are the ones that created a cause. They did something, lovely hot relations, in order for them to come out. Amen. So if you keep on going back, then there had to have been original. Amen. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to build your faith. I don't want you to just be Christian to just say, well, I believe the Lord and he heard my cry and all this other stuff. But people always have these underlying questions about things. Well, I just believe I ain't never questioned God. And sometimes you don't have to because God really reveals himself to you and you're like, man, I felt that for real. And it wasn't uh, Cocoa Puffs neither. I really felt God. I saw, I saw an image and light. I saw something in my room for real, whether it was the devil or whether it was God himself or a theophany or an angel of the Lord. I felt that. Now, somebody says they have an angel visit every single night and all those other different types of things. Now, the devil will come all the time. But God, he doesn't come all the time. His word is there all the time, though. Philosophically, the notion of a beginning or the present order of nature is repugnant. I should like to find a genuine loophole, and that came from Sir Arthur Eddington. <laughs> Amen. So some people like to try to find loopholes, anything but God. Next up, science has also disproven, once again, the concept of eternal universe by saying this. Here's proof point number one. Proof, proof. I need proof, Pastor Martin. Where the proof is in the pudding. The pudding. Okay. The universe is running down. This is what you would call the second law of thermodynamics. Whenever you get into seminary, if Al, if you watch it tonight, uh, the second law of thermodynamics basically says that everything goes from a state of order to disorder. I'll explain it to you like this. If I had a firecracker inside of my hand and I lit it up with a match and then I set it on fire and it goes... <laughs> It went from a state of order, which was in its original it went from a state of order, which was before I struck the match. Donald Duck struck the match and it went out. That's a little hood thing right there. So evolution basically says that everything is going from a state of disorder into order. But last time I checked. When you keep on saying good morning, your body begins to break down. Last time I checked, folk are getting worse and worse, even though the information is getting more and more. Last time I checked, if I take something like that match, I'm going back to the same example, I take a match and then I firecrack and it explodes. Which one of you could take whatever 
explode it into thin air, and you take it and put it back into its original state again? You can. If I take a cup of water and I throw it all over the room, number one, I'll probably get in trouble. <laughs> But number two, I could not find every bit of piece of water and put it right back in that original cup. It would have evaporated. It would have been absorbed into the ground. Well, that's what the sacred law of thermodynamics is. It's when God created things, he created things in order. And then when sin came into the world, everything went into disorder. And what we're trying to do sometimes through religion is we're trying to put the water back in the cup again. But you can't put the water back in the cup because you didn't create the water. Amen. I think some of y'all are getting this. This is good preaching. I'm just going. Something that is running down must have started at some point. That's the reason why as much as you put the oil in the car, <laughs> unless you have a Model T, you're going to have to restart. My motorcycle is in the shop right now. And it's going to cost a couple hundred bucks, bucks to get out. And I was kind of mad, but then I was, I, was, I was okay with it because I put only a baby about 6,000 miles on it since 2003. That's how long I've had it. And I've never changed the tires. <laughs> I've never changed the tires, and I've only gotten one battery in that whole particular period of time. And then they come back to me and they say, you know, uh, 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 Mr. Martin, we have to change the tires and the, and the battery. And I was like, why? It ran for 10 years. It should run forever. The point I'm making is, is that it broke down. It made me mad. But I was like, ugh. So I have to get something new to replace it that will eventually break down again. So everything in this world is breaking down because that's the way that God intended for it to be because sin is here. And because there's sin in the world, then that's the reason why you're not going to get people that's going to be godly. You're not going to get people. Remember, the reason why there's evil in the evil or why people do crazy things is because there's sin in the world, sin in people, or sin in yourself. You can't expect you cannot escape that particular construct. Amen. So there is no such thing as why do bad things happen to good people? Because no one is good. According to God's standards, you may have hidden yourself pretty good. But if I were to open up your mind and play a tape right now, some of y'all be X-rated. Some of y'all have been with other men, other women. Some of y'all would have stole something. Something y'all would have would have would have stolen some things. Some of y'all would have assassinated the president. I'm just talking about what's going on in your head. <laughs> and what happens is that you manifest, and that's why they get you with premeditated murder because you don't thought about that thing first. Amen. The second law of thermodynamics states that the universe is running out of usable energy. If you doubt this, look at the mirror. You're aging and running down. I could look at it. I could just look at my hairline and say, oh, it's not how it was when I first came out. Came out. I had a bunch of hair when I came out in my mama's tummy. Look at all that good hair. Look at all that good. It's nice. It's fluffy. And now it's like, oh, my goodness. And you can't. And what we try to do religiously is try to put some drops. <laughs> Rogaine, all this other I could talk about it comfortably because I done tried it. It will not work. So you might as well be comfortable with yourself. Might as well. I'm just saying. I see the little pattern. Y'all in y'all 20s right now, but when you start getting around your 40s, it's going to be different. So that's why you need to get married when you're young because when you change, it's like, I got you now. <laughs> if you doubt, once again, you look at the mirror, you can see this. The first law of thermodynamics is philosophical in nature. And it can't be empirically proven. In other words, you can't really prove the law itself. You have to watch. I mean, the first law of thermodynamics is philosophical in nature. And you can't prove it. But the second law, you can actually see it happening. All right. Proof point number two. Okay. The universe is expanding. We know this. Well, Pastor Martin, I skipped that science class. I was sleeping. I skipped. I skipped that mod. <laughs> I skipped that class. I went to the mall. Man, please. I, I couldn't even skip in school. So I love science. So here's one of the things right here. Proof number point number two, the universe expanded. Let's look at this. Confirmed through the Hubble telescope. I spoke about that a little bit earlier. So when it came to the Hubble telescope, uh-oh, okay. The Hubble telescope, number two, it's expanding from a single point. The universe is not expanding into space, but space itself is expanding. 
Amen. Commonly called the Big Bang, nothing then bang something. What does all that mean, Pastor Martin? I'm getting ready to go to the Kennedy Space Center after lots and lots of uh, convincing by my son. He said, Daddy, you got to go. You got to go to the Kennedy Space Center with me. I want you to go, Daddy. You got the check? You going to pay for it? I said, son, I gave him $21. Well, it went up to $41. You still going? You got money. You could do it. You got money. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and go to the Kennedy Space Center. And when you get there, they have all this stuff for people going out into space. And when you look out into space, you just see a whole bunch of beautiful stuff. Stars and constellations. What's my zodiac sign? Virgo. All, you see all that stuff up there. All right. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. Well, the scientists said that it's expanding. Well, if it's expanded, then it had to come from a contracted point. So if it came from that contracted point, what caused the contraction? Oh, birth pain. I ain't going to even get into that. I ain't going to get into that. Did you know that the earth, I'm going to divert just for a little split second. Did you know that the earth went before God created, after God created the heavens and the earth, earth was out form of void and darkness was on face of the deep. Do you not realize that water surrounded the earth completely on all sides and there was a big giant rock mass in the middle of it? And then God said, let there be light. And then the water receded into the middle of the earth. That whole thing looks like an embryo. Embryo. Fluid all around it. Has a mass on the middle of it. And then God said, let there be light. And then all of a sudden, stuff started growing just like you. You're beautiful people of God. Why is God so mindful? His mind is so full of you. When he created the, the, the whole universe, he thought about you. When you look at the earth itself, if the atmosphere was off just by 0 .001, everybody would die. You either would be too cold or you would be scorched to death. And there is no other duplicate planet out there. They've been looking for water forever. And finally, the scientists are like, man, I'm tired of, <laughs> President Obama was like, look, I'm tired of sending all this money for y'all to not find anything. You can look for water, because you know water symbolizes life, but they haven't been able to find it. And that bothers people. Because if I find water somewhere else, then I could feed into the whole alien thing. That's what that movie Prometheus was all about. It kept on making all that noise. It was a really weird little movie. Aliens, all the other stuff. Because you got two schools of thought. You got some people who said, nah, there ain't no aliens out there. And then you got other people who are like scientists. Well, I know that we didn't just come from nothing, but at, at, instead of God, maybe it was a, 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 an intelligent life form from somewhere else that planted human cells here, and now they're going to harvest us just like the movie. <laughs> people are crazy. Amen. So let's move. We'll keep on moving. So proof point number three. Radiation echo, and I'm not going to get into this so deeply, but this was discovered by Bell Lab scientists Penzias and Wilson in 1965. Afterglow from the Big Bang won Penzias and Wilson Nobel Prize. The death blow to any theory of the universe being in a steady state. That was what that was, because it's in a steady glow. Because you can't have energy come from nothing. Amen. I think I'm losing some people out of that. I told you, you know, skip the class. You never shouldn't skip the class. You got to stay in your science classes. Next up, proof point number four, galaxy seeds. If Big Bang was true, and I'm not talking about the show that Jamari liked, the Big Bang Theory. If Big Bang was true, then temperature ripples should exist. These ripples would enable matter to collect into galaxies. Cosmic background explorer Kolb launched in 1989 to find them. The findings released in 1992, in other words, perfect or precise ripples found to enable galaxies to form. In other words, if you are religious, it looks like it's like looking at God. That's what he said. How many of y'all have seen things in the stars that look like faces? Eyes. That's still kind of freaky a little bit, too. You'd be like, oh, I ain't going to go out there. <laughs> That's just a little bit too much for me. Let me get some cloud cover. Let me put a hat on. <laughs> But if you ever took it a color telescope, you can look at the sheer beauty of things. How, how beautiful it is. Now, if I go out there, I'm going to die, but I can look at it from here. 
Hey Amen. The gospel is in the stars. I would do a Bible study on that about the belt of Orion and Pleiades, and, and it talks about that in the book in the in the in the book of Job, but how Job was looking at the stars. He said, I'm a loose, God said, I'm gonna loosen the belt of, of Orion. I'm gonna look at Pleiades. And the belt of Orion symbolizes the hunter or the, the devourer, and Pleiades symbolizes the gospel. And you see that in the stars. So you don't have to say, I'm not into astronomy, astrology. You don't have to be in astrology because that's of the devil. But you can definitely look at astronomy. You're just looking at science as a study of what God created. Simple, simply put. So when you see those beautiful things, if you ever, for the daddies and the mamas that are in here, if you look at childbirth just within itself, wow. They bad as all get out now. You want to beat them half to death, but woo, oh, shata! <laughs> I want to take a belt. And just, ah! <laughs> but, but but in the beginning, <laughs> in the beginning, they were all right <laughs> until they started to talk, <laughs> and it was wonderful. I mean, but when you see that, and it's like, oh, this is amazing. I did that with both of my sons. I was like, look at this. And when Andre was born, I had him on my chest. I couldn't even go to sleep. I was holding him because I didn't want nothing to happen to him. And the, the hospital room was freezing. I was getting ready to cuss the lady out and all this other stuff. Why is it so cold to him? My son is, he's, he's freezing. And I killed him on my chest. I, I got like one hour of sleep. I kept on waking up. And I was like, look at this life in my hand. Who invented this? And it loves you back sometimes. It always, you got to feed it. <laughs> All these beautiful things that's going on. And, and, and then somebody has the audacity to say that God does not exist. That's why that worldview is very, very dangerous. Because if God does not exist, then there is no accountability outside of humans. So that's why you always need to test, even with Christians, what tree they're eating from. Either they're eating from the knowledge of tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil which is information without God or the tree of life. And what are we competing with? Those two trees are still beating at each other today. Life versus knowledge. There's a lot of people that know a lot, but they haven't learned anything. And then you got grandma and grandpa that's uneducated, but they live until like 90, 100, 109, whatever it is, and they just as happy. I believe the Lord. That's it. I'm still here. Life versus knowledge. And people are wired for life. That's why even though I be putting all that nice little writings on Facebook, what's more popular than Facebook right now? Instagram, because you ain't got to read nothing. You just look at pictures. <laughs> you just look at pictures, and you see one sentence. My man did this, and then that was it. You get the point. Let's keep on moving. So science also has disproven the concept of eternal use it. Here's proof point number five. Einstein's theory of relativity, I was just talking to this about Andre, with Andre the other day, EMC, EM equals MC squared, I believe that's with the theory of relativity. Einstein's pantheistic bias originally influenced his original formula. Now, let me go back to pantheism. Because some of y'all are like, well, what in the world does pantheism mean? Panther? Panther? Oh, you mean a panther? No. What I mean is, Pantheism is basically an individual that says, well, I don't doubt that God exists, but God is everything. The ant is God. The tree is God. The sky is God. Everything living, even the universe is God. That's why when you hear people talk about the universe, you, you, karma, you don't want to speak against the universe because if you have a good life, the universe if you send something bad into the universe, the universe will send something bad back to you. Don't you? Can't you dig it? Can't you dig it? <laughs> That's pantheism. God is in everything. But God is not in everything. God is the creator. God, in other words, what they're saying is, is that the creator and the creation are synonymous with each other. They're the same. All right. Next up, he was proven wrong by another mathematician. He actually divided by zero. Ooh, I make bring up his name. Einstein called it the worst mistake he ever made. Theory demands an absolute beginning for time, space, and matter. In other words, I want to know how God created the universe. That's what Albert Einstein said. So the next time you go ahead and go into your forums and stuff like that, you want to debate an atheist, you can say, well, you know, Albert Einstein, he wasn't, he, he, he may not have been an outward Christian 
on the surface, but you could basically say that he, because of his research, he said, man, this can't come from nothing. The more you study, the more, the, here's the thing. If you're a very good scientist, it all points to a creator. Where scientists, where some scientists get in trouble, not all, but where some scientists get in trouble is, is when they let their belief get into their work. Amen. A well-rounded scientist will have a belief in God that's driving their work. I want to study. I want to know about the protons, neutrons, and electrons. I want to know about ribonucleic acid. I want to know about deoxyribonucleic acid. I want to, I want to know it because I want to help heal somebody. I want to get down to the deep nitty gritty because I, want, I may come up with an elixir that's going to help this child stop screaming. <laughs> Milocon drops. Some of y'all mamas, y'all don't even know about it. But if dad is, you're like, what in the world is that, bro? Well, you call it Putin. <laughs> Milocon drops. It gets rid of gas. Those, that's a chemical. So somebody intended for that to relieve pain. All right, just a different worldview. I'm just letting you know. You can't massage their stomach all the time. Still, some scientists try to get around this fact by saying, number one, here's the thing. Life on Earth originated from a rocket sent from outer space. He's the co-discoverer of DNA and Richard Dawkins, famed atheist. Collapsing universes, disproven from galaxy seas, not enough energy, imaginary time. That's Stephen Hawking. You ever seen that man that was in that chair? I'm not speaking against him, but you ever go to a Discovery Channel and there's this man in the chair that has, he's in a wheelchair and he talks about, he talks to this machine. This looks like it's a beautiful universe out there and all this other stuff like that, but I still can't say that God exists. If he does exist, then this is very beautiful, but I can't fully, he just says that. Amen. He got wonderful brain power, but his body is, 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 is inanimate. He's, he's forever in the wheelchair. He can't talk, speak, none of that. He can only think. Amen. But if he got to know God, maybe he could get, stand up out of that chair and say, look at what God has done. So I'm just letting you know. I'm just letting you know. It, it moves past the space-time continuum. It goes past knowledge. That's why you should have both and. It doesn't have to be either or. You can be thinking Christians, thinking believers, and you could be in the spirit as well. All right. If you study science deep enough and long enough, it will force you to believe in God. That's what Lord Kelvin said. Also, Stephen Hawking said this. He said, in real time, the universe has a beginning and an end. At, it, the universe has a beginning and an end at singularities that form a boundary to space time and at which the laws of science break down. So you have two schools of thought right there. Just keep on moving. I'm almost done. Something else to consider about an impersonal internality. Once again, this is the whole mind state or the thought process that we all got here by an uncaring entity. Or we got here by a harsh, rugged universe. It's cold, it's dark, if you go out there, you'll die. And that's what created us. It's beautiful and deadly. And that's true. But when you look at the sheer probability of things and the singularity of Earth by itself, and there's no other duplicate planet out there, nothing like it. Nowhere. Ever nowhere. I got an ESPN alert saying that the game is getting ready to start, so I need to hurry up. <coughs> Would it, not be <laughs> Would it not be strange that an impersonal, amoral, <laughs> and purposeless, meaningless universe accidentally created personal beings that are obsessed with right and wrong, meaning and purpose? In addition, no, I'm, let me slow down. Would it not be strange that an impersonal, amoral, no morals, and purposeless or meaningless universe accidentally created personal beings Kids turning around, hugging, let me give it a hug. I need hugs. I need hugs. Okay, you got it. That are obsessed with right and wrong, meaning and purpose. In addition, it's my season. It's a new day. I know that's great. And I see greatness. Yeah, greatness in you, greatness in you. Oh, people are obsessed with being great. There's more to life than just this. Why am I getting older? 
You're getting older for a reason. You know more. You want to get into your careers. You want, you want to learn more. You want to get closer to God. It has purpose. It has meaning. If you don't have any purpose or meaning in your life, then you are existing, and you will be depressed all the time. You're just here. I don't know why I'm here. I'm just here. I was born, and I'm too scared to kill myself. I'm preaching to y'all can look at me. In addition, the question of unity and diversity arise. Unity may be explained by an impersonal internality, but not diversity. What do you mean by that? Look at all the different things. How many of y'all have ever gone outside on a nature trail before? You ever gone outside? Sister Alicia, I know you're looking at technology. You ever went outside on the nature trail? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so you went outside on the nature trail. All you have to do is just look. Uh, my wife took me to the, uh, what was the place, uh, Cypress Gardens, when Jaden was a baby. And I like taking a lot of pictures. And one of the things that really brings me at ease is just looking at God's creation. All right? I like the Bahamas. I told my wife, I said, I like the Bahamas. I like looking at rocks and beautiful things. But let me go to the wilderness one time. Let me go to the continental divide, look at some gophers and things like that, a little bit of dirt. Let me take some pictures. And so we went to Cypress Gardens, and Jaden, he was a little baby, and I love pictures. It's like one of the sweetest pictures. But I saw there was a bunch of yellow lilies down there on the ground. And I took his fat little self, and I sat him right in the middle of those lilies, and I started taking pictures. And I said, look at what God created, two living things. And I just stood there, about to cry. And then Lady Marlon was like, well, come on, let's go ahead and look at the rest of it. So I just picked him up and moved on. All right. She has, she's had likes itinerary. I like sitting in one place and not doing anything. <laughs> so let's look at this. An impersonal eternality means everything must come from impersonality plus time plus chance. No other factors are involved. How could you be a person that was created to love? I was made to love you. I was made to adore you. I was made to love, be loved, be loved by you. Why have love? if it came from something that was unloving? Why care if it came from something uncaring? Why <laughs> have children if there was no creator? Why have emotions if it came from something that was emotionless? Do you realize that you do not have to love in order for, their, for the species to keep going forward? All you have to do is just have lovely hot relations and there'll be people here. But something ends up getting into the problem. Something gets in the middle of that. You have to like somebody. You have to be attracted. You have to be, you, you got to be faithful or you'll die. <laughs> That's for the men. Y'all missed it right there. Oh, Lord. All right. I'm losing them. I'm losing them. So let me move on. Trinity. And I think I'm going to do this about 12 more minutes and then we're going to get out of here and open it up for questions. So let's look at the Trinity. The personal, infinite, and triune God. All right, now we're talking. Let's look at this triangle. Father is not son, is not spirit, is not the father. <laughs> look at the diagram. This helps you look at how you can comprehend the Trinity. Somebody see it? I see Rick shaking his head. He's he, he, he digesting it. Either that, are you, you looking at it? You got it? Okay, he's shaking his head. He said, I get it. I'm going to get you to come up here to preach because everybody in here like, oh, I don't get it. What it's showing you is how the triune nature of God. Now, the Trinity is not in the Bible, the word Trinity, but the triuneness of God is in the Bible. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're all one. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. That's what the diagram is basically saying. They're co-equal persons, but they're still one. All right? I'll give you a quick example. I always like to give this example. This is what God revealed to me many uh, moons ago. When you look at Ezekiel's dream, and it talks about Ezekiel saw the wheel, the wheel in the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw the wheel in the middle of the air. Well, in Ezekiel's dream, he had seen some living creatures that had a face of an ox, face of a lion, face of a man, and face of an eagle. And they were all four different sides, but they were all a part of the same body. They moved perpendicular. They moved this way, and they moved that way. And you couldn't sneak up on them. But they were still one. They had different faces, but they were still one. 
When you think about God, God has different sides, but it's still one. Those angelic beings, those were cherubims. Remember, God created humans, but that's not all he created. He created the heavens and the earth. And when he created the heavens, that include the heavenly hosts or the angels and the cherubims along with him. And they're also made in his image and likeness. Just the spiritual image and likeness, the spiritual imagery. So when you see Ezekiel's wheel and you see the face of an ox, the face of a lion, the face of a man, and the face of an eagle, but it's all on the same body, there are four in one. God in three persons, that cherubim was a cherubim in four persons. You got it? All right. Now that's just something that God gave to me. And it made sense. They're different, but they're the same. They look different, different meanings, but they're the same. So there's unity and diversity. Because we can't go to the Father. Nobody's seen the Father. <laughs> the Father, he, 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 that's a bad man. Nobody's seen God. But some people have seen his son, Jesus. We can relate to Jesus because he is the, that's why I say that word anthropomistic representation of God. That's God in the flesh. We can relate to that because outside of that, we couldn't even know who God was. How can you even be able to get to something that doesn't answer? Through the flesh. How can you get to God <laughs> when he's a spirit and you're not even born again? You're a sinner. And he says he's not talking to you un <laughs> unless he chooses to. And you can shake your fist at him all he wants. He said, I'll just wait until you die. I'll still be here. And then you'll answer to me when you wake up and look at me again. I'm just saying. Let's keep on moving. So let's look at the atheist response. The universe is just there, one idea. Number two, there doesn't need to be a reason, an atheist on a Christian forum. <laughs> there doesn't need to be a reason why they, see, y'all just get going to the forums. They're trying to give you some ammo so you won't be all mad and stuff like that going to bed. When the atheists make this statement, they do so by faith alone. Out the door goes all logic, science, reason, and touching and feeling evidence atheists claim are so necessary to believe in God. Now it becomes a matter of the will. That's why a fool, the scripture says, a fool says in their heart there is no God. It doesn't say it in their mind because the evidence is there. You have to say that with your heart. The truth of the matter is, is that everybody is born an unbeliever. Or else why would you get saved? Makes sense, right? Everybody's born a believer. Uh, uh, one of the young men put a post and it says, you know, does God exist? And I said, absolutely, yes. Well, how do you know? Well, I said, basically, everybody's an unbeliever when they're born because we're born into sin, shaping in iniquity, the iniquities of others, the sin of the world, sin inside of people and sin in ourselves. So you're in the world. That's 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 the reality of the nature. And you will not find out who God is unless God revealed himself through you. To you. That's it. When you get saved and ain't my preaching. <laughs> no. It's the spirit of God. And if God chooses to, to, to touch somebody with his word, because all I'm doing is repeating what the man said. I'm just, a, I'm just an amplifier. Repeating what God has already said. There's no new revelation. So you get saved and you come to the altar all snotting and crying, I believe, I believe, Lord, I believe, Lord, I believe. Now you go from a state from unbelief into belief. You go from being a person that doesn't know who God is, and now God is real to you because you don't got that. You you have that light, that 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 spirit done got. It, it's been turned on on the inside of you now. Now you you see things. You you, you really, I see trees are green, the red roses. Too. You start looking at everything. You start looking at Emmanuel Swedenborg. You look at uh, uh, different animals. The cardinal is several symbolizes the blood of Jesus. You look at the 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 the, the uh, mockingbird that symbolizes alert. So you look at the crane that symbolizes the, the blue crane symbolizes the devourer, you look at the lion, the lion of Judah, you see all of the animals and then that stuff starts speaking to you. You see the two doves. My wife and I have a, a nice little love affair with doves. Doves always show it when something bad is getting ready to happen. And what I usually pray, and see this is what doves mean. Doves don't mean something, they, they're not bad. Amen. But doves mean the peace, prosperity, and faithfulness. So even when stuff goes wrong, God says, I'm still faithful. I still will bring you peace. And I'm still faithful. 
I'm still constant. So you just see a bird on the wire. Oh, really? All of the heavens declare the glory of God. That means his creation, too. Amen. The birds are the most, some of the most ancient things that were created. He created birds before he created humans. Okay. You look at him a little bit more. I'm not saying worship him. I'm just saying God can speak through anything. His eye is on the sparrow. Therefore, I know he watches over me. I was going through a very serious time in ministry, and I was getting very, very depressed, and my wife would attest to this. It was a big, giant, fat sparrow that looked like a little chicken, and it landed in the back of our yard. Sparrows do not come in the back of our yard. And it sat right there, and I started bawling. And I was like, well, God, you got your eyes on me. Because here's the thing. I was thinking of the song, and then the, the, the sparrow plopped down right there as I was thinking of the song. Now, God ain't going to talk to you, but he'll show you a lot. I'm just telling you how he talks to me. That's how he talks to me. And then every now and then, you'll have a witness along there with you to see how God talks to you. So my wife knows how God talks to me. Amen. You begin to get open up. I'm starting to preach, man. Let me get out of here before I start just getting over. So, so, so you see all of this right here. So atheism is not merely being an unbeliever. Because there's people that are unbelievers, but they still feel something on the inside that draws them. I know there's something outside here. I know there's more than my life than just this. Why can I think? Why can I talk? Why can I walk? Why can I taste, touch, see, or smell? Why do I love so hard? Why do, every time I go to the, to, the, to, the, to, to the club and I hear my slow jam come on, I think about that ex-boy, that ex-girlfriend. Oh, I hate them so much, but if they call me, I'll be right over there. I'm just preaching. I mean, Y'all can look at me and say whatever you want to say. So an atheist has to purposely deny all of that evidence from their heart. You have to, just like you have to be born again to be a believer, and there's a transition, there's also a transition into atheism where you have to repress and you have to deny all of this evidence around you and just say, poof, it just happened. I'm worm food. Amen. I think I'm a Stop at this next piece. I think I'm going to stop right there. That was a good preaching moment. I should have had the organ, but it's okay. All right. So next week, we're going to look at some of this stuff. I got three minutes left, so we try to get through this. I probably won't be able to get through. Oh, no, I can finish. I got four slides left. All right, so I'm going to make it hit and quit it. The atheist response to this is, number one, evolution disproves God. There's this big, giant battle, Bill Nye. Ken Ham, they debated each other. People were all in the tizzy. Creation Museum, you see, and you see dinosaurs and all this other stuff like that. The Bible talks about dinosaurs. They call it Leviathan, the Behemoth. It's all these different names. The names have changed. You won't find the word dinosaur in the Bible because the word dinosaur is a new word. It was invented in the 1400s, but the Bible still has the same type of creatures that are in there. They call it the Beast of the Deep, the the, the monster. All these other, it's already in there. Amen. And it's many people out there, and we did a series on this last year, that believe that the earth is millions of years old. But they can't prove that the earth is millions of years old, and they begin to contradict themselves, and here's how. You can't observe, because remember, they always talk about evidence and observable evidence, right? You need to take you scientific theory, you need to get the data, the facts, the whole nine yards. But remember, you can't observe backwards. If you weren't there, then how can you be the how can you become the most foremost authority and use my dad's words the foremost authority on history if you weren't there carbon dating as in this nice little thing the carbon dating changes its numbers each and every time the earth is around 10,000 years old according and it falls in line with the bible the only reason why they like to put out millions of years is because they want to come up with some other answer besides God did it. And that we morphed into one thing, into the next thing. But there's never been, that's where you get the missing link from. What's the missing link between the fish that came from out of the ocean and then us? Mermaids. 
you know where the mermaid story comes from? Because they're trying to come up with a transition between the fish and then the human. <laughs> but you like the fairy tales, so. though. The Discovery Channel came up with the story called Mermaids Are Mermaids for Real? And I actually watched that foolishness. <laughs> I did. I promise you, I did. And they, they were putting stuff out there as if mermaids were really the transitional species between fish and human. Because you know we all came from monkeys, right? I'm just saying. We, we started off like this, and then we came up like this. It looked like this. <laughs> Some of us still got a lot of hair on us, too. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> what was that one wrestler name? I forgot what that wrestler name was. He had hair all on his back. Oh, my goodness. Y'all don't like hair. Some of y'all ladies do like the hair. You like the little muscly man, don't you? <laughs> I've lost the whole audience. Father, thank you for this time. <laughs> we worship you and we praise you. We thank you for these, your people, in Jesus' day. Amen. Are there any questions at all? Oh, praise God. Glory to God in the higher. Any questions? That was a statement. Is this a good one? Think about it. Is it related to the topic tonight? I'm just messing with you. Okay, go ahead. Quite a few people believe in Some of us, um, um, Christian folk, believe in reincarnation. Reincarnation, reincarnation is a part of pantheism. It's an Eastern religion or Eastern school of thought that says, a lot of times you see it in Hinduism, um, you see it in um, Buddhism, where you came in this life as one particular entity and when you die, if you don't get it right, you come back as an ant or a frog or another person. Remember a couple of years ago, there was a lot of people who were hypnotizing people. Or oh, remember that thing? I'm going to use a little humorous example of that reincarnation piece. In Eddie Murphy's movie called Coming to America, <laughs> there was a lady that had her hand over a match. And all of our crazy selves tried it in school, too. <laughs> this is crazy stuff. So she lit a match, and she lit, she lit a match, and she had her hand over a match. And she said, I was Joan of Arc in a former life. <laughs> reincarnation. That was just putting that out there. But you don't know what you were in that former life. I popped that pause. I was like, well, how would I know I had a former life? I only remember this one. <laughs> but they're pumping it into the culture through things like the avatar. All right, I'm, I'm preaching. Y'all Y'all like the little cartoons or whatnot, but I'm letting you know the avatar. Or when you look at the blue avatar that Disney is trying to do right now where you start off life as a human, but then you turn into this big, giant blue thing. <laughs> Amen. They had a lot of African ancestral worship going on inside of the avatar. James Cameron, a whole bunch of it, that whole thing swinging around. I had to stop looking at the TV. My wife was like, you better turn that off. <laughs> it had that little weird feeling because you, you looking at it as entertainment, but them chants are coming inside of your house. Yeah. Yeah. I'm breezy. Y'all, okay. Yeah. Amen. I'm still going to the park, though, when I get it in Disney World, though. <laughs> there won't be no chat. Now, I'm believing Jesus Christ. I ain't got to be scared of no devil. Come on now. So reincarnation basically is an Eastern ancient philosophy of you leave this world, and then you come back, and you get a do-over. I call it a uh, cosmic mulligan. Mulligan is basically when you get a do-over for all y'all play golf, you, you mess up, you hit it in the water, you get the ball and say, can I get a do-over? And you drop the ball down again. <laughs> and then hopefully you get it this time. But reincarnation is not biblical at all. The Bible says a man is appointed once to die. And then the judgment. But God is sovereign. Because even though you're appointed once to die, he can raise you up again. Raise the dead. So you died, but he could bring you back to life. Look at Lazarus. Look at other people around the world that died for 50 seconds. And that's why that little movie that came out, um, um, I might go see it, talk about heaven is real. You know, you got two schools of thought that's out there. Um, the first school of thought is, is that it's unbiblical because everything that the little boy mentioned, um, you can't find it in scripture, so you got that one particular line. But then 
scripture also says that nobody really knows. You, you see some stuff, but you don't see, you, you don't know everything because it's, it's such a beautiful place. You have no idea. And how is a child going to come up with stuff? So I think there's some truth into what he's saying. I think the scripture, you have to take that into account. But the, the, um, what was it? Paul said that he visited up to the third heavens, and there's certain things that he saw that he could not even speak about. Amen. So even though the scripture says it's appointed one person to die and then there's the judgment, but God can bring you back if he wants to. He can go against whatever he wants because whatever he says is the truth. He's the source of all truth. All right. Well, you got your feet up in my seat. Yes. All right. Very good. Yes. God is the boss of us, but he's a he's a boss that's not really authoritarian. Or in other words, I heard that. Uh, ESPN thing. I know, I know. Are there any other questions? It's been, the Thunder is supposed to be playing against the, um, the Memphis Grizzlies tonight, and I know I got to get to the house. Anything else? Y'all got anything else? I'm in the flesh completely right now. My wife is just looking at me smiling. She's like, come on, preacher. Come on, preacher. Are there any other questions? That was a good one, reincarnation. But yes, God is the boss of us, but he doesn't make us do things. This is just for some of the old folks in here. In here. He, he has a um, laissez-faire, I learned that in um, um, business class, he has a laissez-faire management style. He kind of sits back, he guides you, and then if you screw up, he'll teach you, get back in order, versus authoritarian style, which is all down your throat, like he was in the Old Testament. So God went from authoritarian to laissez-faire with Jesus. <laughs> but it's all the same God, all right? Father, thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next week. Stop. Yes. You had a question, Ms. Winslow? Oh, offering. She said get the offering. All right. Uh, Brother Ramir, come up here to get the uh, thing. Stop the stream before the music goes through. There you go. You stop the stream? Oh, okay. Bye. 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 See you next week.